Welcome to Tales at Scale, a podcast that cracks open the world of analytics projects. I'm your host, Rena from Imply, and I'm here to bring you stories from developers doing cool things with Apache Druid, real-time data and analytics, but way beyond your basic BI. I'm talking about analytics applications that are taking data and insights to a whole new level. And unless you were in cryosleep on a mission in deep space, you've probably heard about OpenAI's ChatGPT. Generative pre-trained transformers like ChatGPT, for example, are artificial intelligence models that use deep learning techniques to generate human-like text. And honestly, they're getting good, like scary good at it. GPT models are based on deep neural network architecture called a transformer, which is known for its ability to handle sequential data effectively. So what does this all have to do with data, analytics, and or Apache Druid? Well, you can combine a trained natural language processing model with Apache Druid for sentiment analysis. And this isn't just hype. I'm joined by someone who did that very thing. Rick Jacobs, Senior Technical Evangelist here at Imply. Rick, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So I like to always kick off with uh, asking my guests a little bit about themselves and how they got to where they are today. So can you tell me a little bit about your journey? Sure. So um, I've always been curious about technology. So as a kid, I was a curious kid. I did get the opportunity to do some programming back in high school. So uh, I'm dating myself a little bit, but back then I think it was Apple II or it might've been a Macintosh, but that's what we were using. And I was coding in a language called basic. And as the name suggests, it was a very basic language. (laughs) You have worked as like a data scientist and a data engineer. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So um, started out in development. So I, you know, I I got a master's in computational science, started doing some development work. That was pretty cool. And I moved from there into systems engineering, Um, again, more on the development side. And then I became an SE, so a sales engineer. So, which means, you know, I'm an engineer, but I'm working with the sales teams to try to generate revenue. So that's a revenue generating um, function. Then I moved over to um, marketing. So now I'm a technical marketing manager. I do things like blogs. I think that's what we're going to discuss today and those types of activities. But I feel like you're so much more than that because you are a tinkerer, right? You are in there. You are figuring out different ways to do things, how stuff works. You're doing demos. And one of the things that actually, you know, reason we wanted to do this episode is because you have been playing around with uh, chat GPT and Apache Druid, which is what this show is all about. Um, Before we get into that, when did you first start, you know, messing around with Apache Druid? Were you familiar with it before you were at Imply or is this a new thing for you? So I had heard of Druid previously. Um, but Druid is a high performance analytical database. And in my past duties, I didn't necessarily have to, to utilize Druid. So I heard of, of the Apache Druid project. I did look at it, you know, sparingly, but, um, I hadn't started really thinking with it until very early this year. So like in the beginning of this year. And like, you know, AI has been a hot topic. By the way, I feel like I say hot topic on this show all the time, but here's another hot topic. And with the introduction of ChatGPT, it's never been, you know, more top of mind for folks, not just in our tech community, but kind of everywhere. Um, You've been exploring how Druid can work with ChatGPT, and that might not be obvious to some folks. So can you talk to me a little bit about how you know, you got started working with Druid and ChatGPT together? Sure. So I did do some data science work back in my development days. I did quite a bit of that, utilizing various uh, platforms, some open source, some not. Uh, So with ChatGPT becoming available and hearing so much about it, what I thought of doing is utilizing it within the Druid environment. So to try to create some applications that use ChatGPT as the uh, modeling, as the AI model, and then drew it as a backend database. So can you give me some, you know, practical use cases of what you came up with? Yeah, tons of use cases. So um, the, the one I, I came up with was more social media analysis. So we're using ChatGBT to analyze tweets. So what we do is we connect to Twitter, um, get some tweets back from Twitter based on a certain criteria. So I think the criteria I used for this one was actually ChatGBT. So I was looking for tweets on ChatGBT took those tweets and then used ChatGPT's um, sentiment analysis functions to determine the type of user that would send that tweet, the sentiment of the tweet, et cetera. Then I utilized that knowledge from within Druid. That's kind of meta using ChatGPT to uh, do sentiment analysis on itself, basically. Yeah. 
It was pretty interesting. I thought that would be cute. And it does seem to have a certain bias towards itself. I, I didn't get into a whole lot of that in plot, <laughs> but as I was going through the data, it seemed to like itself quite a bit. I don't know if that's like cool or scary. Okay, so so the data set that you used was tweets from Twitter, correct? Yes, ma'am. So um, I connected to Twitter, got all the recent tweets about ChatGBT, and then sent those tweets to ChatGBT and asked it a range of questions regarding those tweets. What did you use to uh, ingest that data into Druid? Um, so Druid's got several ingestion opportunities, there's several ways to ingest data into Druid. So I use an injection spec. So you can create an ingestion spec in Druid and then uh, execute that ingestion spec. So I did that, but I did that automatically from code. So create the spec and then ingest the spec from code. And how did you, you know, plot the distribution? Uh, plotting the distribution was fairly easy. I use a library called matplotlib. Um, it's a very popular uh, data ingestion library, um, so it's pretty well documented. It can produce different types of, of graphs. This one, I just did a simple pie chart. And though, you know, it's kind of funny when you read those, read things out loud like that or talk about things out loud because it's like code snippets or database libraries or different libraries are meant to be like seen on a screen. And for those who are listening, um, Rick actually has a fantastic uh, blog post about this very thing that has code snippets and everything so you can see how he did it. But I want to kind of go a little back a little bit and talk a little bit about why you chose, you know, Druid, aside from our own bias towards the technology, for this scenario. Why is Druid a good a good choice to uh, do sentiment analysis with ChatGPT? Yeah, so the major edge that Druid has is its speed. So um, sub-second speed for just about any query. And that's really why I, I utilized uh, Druid for this particular situation. I'm doing analysis. Druid is an analytical database, and I need it to be fast. So in the real world, if you're deploying something like this, trying to think how to put this nicely. So if you are an agency, whether that be government or private, and you're trying to monitor tweets, uh, you need the results of your analysis quickly. You can't wait till tomorrow to get the analysis because let's say you're an NYPD trying to look at bad guys. And knowing that the bad guy is going to strike tomorrow doesn't help when he strikes today, right? So if you tweet something about it, you need to catch that immediately, which is one of the use cases for something like this, by the way. So in that situation, time is of you know paramount essence. Time is very important. So to answer your question directly, I use Druid mainly because of the speed. Actually, that is like kind of an incredible uh, example. That's like, you know, a lot of times we're using like, you know, ad tech and, you know, IoT, like kind of, um, you know, less dire, <laughs> less dire examples. But, you know, that could be incredibly important. Sticking with, you know, Druid, you know, what makes it kind of what makes Druid a standout in real time environments? You mentioned speed. You know, how does it integrate with other data sources or databases and streaming technology like Kafka or Kinesis? Yeah, that's important too. So again, it's, it's important to be able to interact with other streaming services. And it's also important to be able to utilize the, the benefits of speed, like I mentioned before, that Druid has. Uh, Druid has a seamless interaction with Kafka. So you don't have to do any connection. You can just use a Druid UI, um, specify the topic you're trying to ingest from, and that's pretty much most of what you need to get Kafka interested into Druid. That's obviously, you know, a big benefit. In my situation, because I was ingesting tweets, I didn't ingest the tweets directly through Kafka. I could have done that, but I wanted to show how you could ingest batch data into Druid. So I collected the tweets as a batch and then ingested them versus, I mean, ingested them as a batch versus ingesting them as a stream directly from a service like Kafka. Okay, so you have options. In well, I mean, we talk about the best of both worlds is another kind of thing that we've been we're talking about a lot on the show where you can, you know, Druid is great for batch, but also for streaming. So whatever way you're dealing with data is fine. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, so the reason to save it, generally what you do in situations like this, again, let's use NYPD again. If you're trying to, to keep tabs on what people are saying on Twitter, for example, you may save that data down as a CSV file because other analysts are going to use it in that format. So you'll have other analysts using the CSV format to do what they do. And then in a situation like this, somebody like me, who is more technical, is using it in CSV format, but uploading it to a database so that I can have that persistent data, which means I can check it against other, other tweets that come in, say, tomorrow. So I can check today's tweet 
against tomorrow's tweet and see, I could test, for example, if uh, the rhetoric is getting more violent, let's say. Mm -hmm. so Infl that, I was going to say inflammatory. <laughs> That's a great word. <laughs> So you can you can compare. It's called regression analysis in the in the uh, data when the uh, big data world regression analysis. So you can do some regression analysis in terms of how these tweets are changing and how they're becoming more inflammatory, as you said. I hate to keep using this NYPD example, but I think it's one that most people will understand. Yeah, I mean, in like you know, especially in <laughs> today's today's world, exactly. uh, I wish most people didn't understand that, but that's uh, where we are. Um, okay, so are there any other you know projects you're working on with Druid and uh, you know GPTs or any and other AI related projects that you're working on right now? Yeah, so one that I'm working on that's pretty interesting. It's similar to the previous one in terms of you need the responses quickly. So again, I'm using you to do it for that. I'm probably going to do chat GBT as the model, as the, the model that, that we ask our questions, but I can replace chat with GBT with another uh, AI model if I feel, if I feel the need, but this one is doing churn analysis. So basically you enter a review of a product, let's say. So think of Amazon, you're reviewing a product and you enter your review and the model senses whether that review is positive or negative and based on the level of negativity let's say it sends you a, a retention message so it'll send you an email to try to retain you if it the model determines that you are a churn risk so it's, if it determines that you might leave we automatically send you an email to try to retain you you know 20 percent off or something like that again speed is very important you want this person to hit enter on sending that review and then you want before they can blink, the email is in their inbox. That's kind of what I'm working on currently. I could have used that in my previous life when I did social commerce for Sony and managed their review platform. That would have made my life so much easier. <laughs> yeah, lots of use cases for this one also. I mean, it's this particular one I'm working on is, is churn retent, well, churn analysis and then retention. But there's, you know, medical use cases where you want to have the doctor have his information extremely readily available. So again, he comes in, a patient comes in, the patient has certain um, uh, illnesses, certain uh, characteristics that might suggest a particular recommended uh, course of treatment, prescription, etc. cetera. Um, the doctor can enter that information into his computer and then he gets an immediate recommendation. That's something that's being worked on. I remember one of the projects that I worked on in the past was something very similar to that. I'm not sure how we've progressed technically in that particular use case, but it's another one where speed is very important and it's important to be able to analyze that data very quickly. You know, you bring up a good point when we're talking about safety and security, right? But all, and also, you know, um, healthcare. These are both very important examples. You know, as AI systems become more and more a part of our everyday life, how important is it to, you know, make sure that they're aligned with like the best human intentions and values? Yeah. So that's a question I've been seeing on and used quite a bit. From my perspective, there is a danger of AI becoming self-aware and starting to make this decisions that are in its best interest. But I think the main danger is having these technologies fall into bad hands, right? So you have some some somebody with some programming skills might be, you know, the kid next door in his basement, and he's using an AI model. So they're, by the way, they are AI models available for free. So a lot of them is uh, GBT for all. Um, and then there's things like chat GBT that you, you have to pay for depending on how much you use it. But the point is, it's not extremely difficult to get your hands on an AI model. So a, a kid can get his hands on an AI model and start, you know, developing applications that he thinks are funny, but, you know, we might think are dangerous. <laughs> or it can even be unintentional, right? So in my, in my previous life, I talked a lot about ethical and responsible AI. Um, and one of the key things was, you know, eliminating bias. So someone may be using a data set that's highly biased, but not realize it because the machine only knows what it's given. Right. And so it's just going to run off of the data that it's presented. We see it sometimes, you know, you even mentioned with chat GPT kind of favoring itself like a little bit, but it kind of depends on what you're you're feeding it in the first place or where it's pulling from. And I don't know if AI is smart enough to tell like what's 
real information and what's fake information and where biases may be. So that's another another concern. Yeah, that's actually a very big concern. It's something we we spent a lot of time in in college. So I was doing this stuff in college too. Back then, AI models weren't where they at now, right? They were just starting to learn stuff and becoming genetic type networks. But bias is certainly an issue because if the AI learns on bad data, as, as you mentioned before, it learns that bias that's within the data set. How we addressed it back in those days is we kind of hard coded around it. So if we noticed that this bias was happening, we would adjust the, the results that the AI was getting to manage for bias. So we might weigh certain um, parameters less, for example, because we know those parameters have some some bias implicit with them. I am not sure if that's what they do at models like chat GBT, but um, that's how we tended to handle that type of stuff back, you know, years ago. I don't want to say how many years, but years ago. No, no, you don't have to say, you don't have to say how many years, but at least people have been sort of working on that problem because, but I do feel like AI is moving so fast that we haven't really solved for that just, just yet. But it's a known problem. So, you know, I, again, I'd have to go check and see how ChatGBT handles it, but it's a known problem. I'm sure it's something they um, found a way to, to manage. You know, one thing that you could do if you want to work with Apache Druid and ChatGPT together is also create your own data set, right? If you just want to tinker with it and figure out how it works at a time, I know that um, Helmar Becker, who is on the show, uh, creates his own data set of flight data. So that might be a way if you want to, you know, avoid that and just kind of play around with the two technologies is another thing that you can do. Yeah, I mean, creating your own data set is good, but uh, the real the real issue with these models is the models are already trained. So that GBT is already trained. So it's trained on whatever data set it's trained on. And, you know, you made a good point where hopefully that data set that it's trained on is not biased. So creating your own data is is helpful because you you have an idea of what's within the set that you created. But um, the whole idea is to train it initially on data that's not biased in the first place. Are there any other use cases where you can use ChatGPT and Druid? Tons. <laughs> so we talked about the social media one. We talked about, you know, the NYPD one. We talked about data set where it's full of patient information gathered by doctors and the doctors looking for a recommendation. There's also brand monitoring, some of the churn one I mentioned earlier. Um, where you're trying to monitor what people are saying about your brand. So Twitter could be a, a good way of doing that. So you're monitoring what Twitter is, what people are saying on Twitter about Druid, for example. And then based on what they're saying on Twitter about Druid, you might make certain decisions. So there's, you know, the, the use cases are almost endless. There's a lot of situations where you want additional information that models like ChatGBT can provide. For sure. And I feel like, you know, the speed in which you need to deal with data is only going to increase. And that's actually one of the benefits of Druid, as you mentioned, that it is super fast and it can handle. We always talk about like petabytes of data. You don't have to have petabytes of data, but if you do have petabytes of data, uh, it can handle that for you. Right. Well, Rick, I mean, we feel like we covered a lot of examples here on uh ChatGPT and Apache Druid. And hopefully, hopefully uh, we don't see uh, AI become self-aware um, anytime soon um, for the sake of humanity. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining me today. This has been amazing. Um, and as a reminder, Rick has an awesome blog post if you want to check that out with code snippets if you're interested in doing something similar with sentiment analysis. And if you would like to learn more about, you know, anything we talked about on the show today, including Apache Druid, please visit druid.apache.org or imply.io. Rick, thanks again for joining me. Again, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Until next time, folks, keep it real. Ciao.